recording. Okay, recording is on. So Neil's not here. So, all right. So recording is on. Um, so, like I said, if you go to if you go to Brightspace, right under content. All right, so if you go to Brightspace and then you look up the module for reinforcement learning, this is these are the notes from Monday. This is uh, a link to the code, the code that we're currently working on. It's already on um, on 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 GitHub, so many so many places. And then there's this link that I provided. It's basically. Um, couple of chapters. You can ignore this one, generative adversarial networks. But if you scroll down all the way to chapter nine, you can read through this. This is reinforcement learning. So it, you know, it's a lot of what I said, uh, but it's, it's a chapter basically. So if you want to do some reading on it, it kind of talks about Frozen Lake, um, which is another game an easier game to um, to taxi cab. Um, so you can take a look at it. I haven't updated this for taxi cab. So currently I just have the video, but someday. So anyway, uh, you can read through this. You can see that there's a lot of information there um, about the algorithm. So it might be of interest to you. Also, you know, as we were talking about term projects, so I've introduced a new topic now, which is reinforcement learning. So if you have an interest in this for your term project, uh, let me know. Okay. So, you know, obviously this one's a little bit more complex, but you can, um, you know, you might have an interest in it. So we can talk about it. All right. So. Those are just, I just wanted to point out some additional uh, materials that you can read through, you know, under the, the module that, to help you with your understanding of it. Oh, shit. All right, so now let's switch over to the script. Uh, so if you remember, I was going over this with uh, Notepad, Notepad++, so you're seeing that there, Taxi Cab. Uh, I'm also going to open up the Anaconda prompt. Okay, and just the demo again. So let me just navigate to the course. Okay. And so I'm going to, just to make sure everything is working, I'm going to actually share that just to kind of start there again before we get into the code. So you can see here, you should be seeing the command prompt, I think. All right, so now uh, this is going to be Python. Taxi. All right, and there it is. So if you remember, this is what we were looking at. This is the game, the simple 2D board game. The little yellow square is the taxi, and it tries to pick up the passenger and then drive them to another destination. So the locations are Y, R, G, B, and it just picks, it can pick these. Um, I think it's currently set to just start always at RGB. Oh, sorry, at, at RY. All right, and then it does this for a while. So it's training, you know, I think it's 100,000 iterations. So it's kind of using Q learning, it's trying to learn the best route. And then once it's done that, hopefully it'll, it'll stop training and then it'll start um, using what it learned to, to play the game. So as I said, I motivated that this has been used, you know, so obviously more advanced versions of this, you know, Q learning with deep learning and, and various optimization um, tricks. You know, it has been used to develop an agent that can play um, 
that can play Go, which is a, an, an ancient uh, game, board game. It can play chess, which, you know, we all know chess. And Shoji was actually the right name, Shoji, which is the Japanese version of chess, which is the difference is that it's, it's got, um, instead of eight by eight, which is 64, I think it's more than that. And it's got, you know, when, when you kill a, a piece, you don't kill it like in chess. Instead, it goes to the other side. So it, it just makes the complexity of the game bigger. And so that's the importance of that. And the algorithm did really well, so well that it beat masters of, 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 of the three games. And it was just one single algorithm that generalized really well uh, to all these algorithms. So it got published in Nature. And it, you know, it's, it's, that's a big deal. That's like literally a very big deal. And so this is, you know, that's why I always make an effort in any machine learning course to throw reinforcement learning because, unfortunately, some courses never even touch on reinforcement learning and, you know, you're not aware of that. And it's kind of, you know, it's, it's important, especially now that with deep learning, it has been coupled together. So if you ever take the, the graduate level course that we have here on deep learning algorithms, you know, that the goal would be uh, in that iteration of the course to cover deep reinforcement learning now that you guys have a good foundation. All right, so let's, so I'm going to stop this, I, you know, I'm not going to let it continue running. You can definitely play with this, hopefully at home. Um, you know, that might be just the homework. You know, the homework might just be to, to use this game and, and kind of try different configurations and really just report your results. You know, how you, run, you run it for how many times, but that will be, you know, right now you have plenty of homeworks with the Weka homework and uh, singular valid decomposition. So we'll wait. There's, there's one more aspect actually of reinforcement learning that I want to cover, which is uh, related to the states. But that part will have to wait until after spring break. So when we come back from spring break, I'll probably cover that to wrap up reinforcement learning. Then I'll assign the homework. And then from there, we'll move on to the, the next topic, which will be the perceptron, which I'm sure you should be excited about that because the perceptron is like the grand, great, great, great grandfather of deep neural networks. So we'll start with um, th that will wrap up the semester just talking about, you know, neural nets, deep neural nets, you know, artificial neural networks and all that. All right, so uh, I stopped the game here. The game has stopped. So now <clears throat> let's go back to the code just to kind of wrap it up and then we'll have time to just, you know, talk about homework, etc. So here we have, um, and just to I am recording. All right, so just to wrap up the code. So we talked, you know, if, if you don't remember, go back to the previous video. This is two in the series, right? And then this one just, uh, we're gonna continue the algorithm. So we've already talked about action states to so remember all of that, right? So in, in this <clears throat> <clears throat> approach, we have, um, Action, we don't, the agent is really the algorithm. So the, the agent would be this code, okay? This code functions in this code that interact with N. N, remember, is the environment. But everything is going to be uh, defined by, um, everything is going to be defined by states and actions, okay? So you're in a state which basically the best intuitive thing is you're somewhere in the board of the, of the board game. So you made a move in chess, you have a specific position, you know, you moved your queen to this place and you have all these other pieces in all these other places. So, and your, and your uh, adversary also moved their pieces, of course. So then you're in that state. And then now given that state, what's the best action to take? Well, that basically means if you're playing chess, you know, where, what would you move now? You know, cause you have a lot of options, right? And that, that is what brings in the, a lot of the complexity of chess itself, okay? So, so the question is, 
you know, what, what piece do you move? And that's the action. Okay. So what action do you take? And then given that action, your piece is now in a new place and your adversary moves their piece, which means that you now end up in another state. Okay. So from the point of view of you, the adversary, you know, whatever they do, that's just, you know, you can't control that. So that's just the, the state. Like if you are playing basketball and you shoot the basket, the ball, and, you know, it bounces off of something, right? So you don't control that. That's just like the physics, that would be called like the physics of the game. So in a sense, where, where the adversary moves is also the physics of the game. It's just, you're playing against them, right? So really you go from one state, you take an action, you end up in another state and you keep doing that and think about it. You do that in time, right? So there's a component of sequence, right? So time, you know, T time T plus one time T plus two and so on as you're moving along. So there's this component of sequence and there's this component of dependence, almost like the conditional probabilities that we talked about in naive Bayes. So if you, if you remember in naive Bayes, we talked about sequence as well a little bit when we said, well, you know, you know, we have these, the, you know, uh, the conditional probability, we have this. So what is the probability of this given that, right? So it's a similar um, idea intuitively. Okay, and so uh, we go from one state, take an action, end up in another state, keep doing that for a while. And we have to play well, we have to make good moves that eventually lead to a win, okay? And so that's really, you can think of uh, reinforcement learning as, you know, taking us, if I take this sequence of actions given the states, or this other sequence of actions and given the states, which one of these will result in better results? And that's what it has to learn. So it's almost like by trial and error, it has to try this direction and see what it gets in one game. And then update, you know, at the end of the game, it gets a bad reward. So it knows, okay, those actions in that sequence were not good. I'm gonna try these other ones and maybe these ones are better. And so it, it kind of then, it next time around, it will use some of those, right? Some randomness should be added in the beginning so that it doesn't repeat the exact same thing. So, but it'll still try because those were allotted, you know, higher values, okay? Because of the reward system. So that brings us to this idea of rewards and it brings us to this idea of states. And as I said, that part, Coding the states and coding the rewards is actually pretty challenging. It's one of the most, you know, getting, understanding the algorithm is quite straightforward, to be honest. But, but the part of, um, the part of um, setting up in the environment, the rewards, or setting up in the environment, the, the state mechanism, that's complicated. Okay, so for instance, the example I gave you on Monday of the flight simulator, right? So you saw that flight simulator. So for that flight simulator, even though we have the simulator, right? So we have the simulator, we still have to create the representation of the states. We have a lot of information in the flight simulator. We have to pick very much like in machine learning and other problems in supervised learning, where you have to figure out what the features are going to be. So remember the problem of network analysis, right? So what are the features going to be? So that it's very much like that in, in, in figuring out those states, you know, that can be challenging. Um, and then encoding it in an efficient way that can be challenging. And then the rewards, the reward functions is also challenging. Okay. You know, how do you, Let's say you want to teach, like I said on Monday, you want to teach a robot in a simulator to learn how to dance, you know, salsa. What is the reward function for, for, for dancing salsa really well? You, you know what I mean? It's really hard to encode these things. We don't know how we do it in our brains yet, but, you know, once we figure that out, I mean, that's going to be huge. Because that's really, honestly, like if, you know, one of the, one, the thing, in my opinion, that will take us closer to AI is reinforcement learning. Because the disadvantage with supervised learning is you have to label so much data that only Facebook and Google, you know, because 
everyone's always liking pictures and things. Only they have that many labels. And on supervised learning, well, you know, that's challenging, obviously, although there's been a lot of progress in that as well. So it's really unsupervised. And then this semi-supervised idea of reinforcement learning, where you can allow the game to learn as long as you're able to just come up with a simple set of rules. So rules in games obviously go together really well. When we move things to the more complex world that we live in, like driving a car in, in the interstate, when there's a lot of traffic and icy roads and whatever, that can be pretty challenging. But some people might argue that it's only a matter of time before they can model that as a game. And then after that, in simulators, the agents would be able to figure out the best you know, actions to take given the state and eventually, hopefully, that would be moved to physics, right? To the, or the physical world, I should say. And so it certainly, um, we certainly have the hardware now with Spot, for instance, from Boston Dynamics, all those things they have. And so all it's missing is the AI. And, and a lot of people, very smart people, are working on that. All right, so anyway, so the states representing encoding the states and encoding the reward functions is really the most difficult part of reinforcement learning. I want you to understand that. And as I was saying, for instance, you know, you know, I'm working with a student. You saw the video of that plane that we're trying to, we're, we're basically just trying to stay, let, uh, have it stabilize itself. Then we're hopefully trying to get it to fly from point A to point B. You know, our student also, he says that he wants it to, to take off. <laughs> That's probably more dangerous because, you know, taking off means you're really close to the ground. So whenever we do this, we take the plane to like 4,000 feet so that, because you should see it. Uh, I should post a video actually. Beginning, the plane is just like, it's scary how it's moving. And it just, sometimes if I start, I think like below 3,000 feet, it always crashes because it just is completely out of control and because it's randomly learning at first. So, um, so the challenge there with the plane for us right now is the state system, we kind of have that figured out, but um, the, we don't know that we have the right feature yet, right? So we're working on that. So I, I just want to stress this because this is important. I want you, I want you to be, this is going to seem easy and I don't want you to think everything is easy. So. Um, so creating and getting the right features and the state representation that we have, we're still working on that. That's difficult. Um, we're also using deep reinforcement learning. So that's another issue. And then the third one, and I, and I, and I would think also the very difficult one, getting the right reward function. You know, how do you teach a plane, you know, how do you reward, you know, don't crash. How do you write a reward function for that? Fly stable. Don't make people throw up inside the plane, you know, by taking or scare them, right? You know, it can be very scary when you see a plane, you know, doing things. So those are the main challenges. Now, why is AI gym great? AI gym, which, what is AI gym? So you should be seeing on here, right? You should be seeing on here. Uh, the library. The beauty of AI Gym is that it's got all the, all these games. And by the way, there's another um, there's another library out there that has the Atari games. Okay, so if you guys, for instance, if you guys wanted to do a term project with the Atari games, you know, by bringing in the library and just kind of trying it out, we can talk about that. That could also be a project. Um, but like I said, you know, it can be a supervised learning project, like just cats and dogs or, or text or something. It can be a recommender system. You know, I, I think recommender systems are something you can literally, if you go to a company someday in the, in the right settings, you can work on that. Um, you know, and, and really, you know, selling is about increasing sales. I mean, it, you know, that's, that's really where the, the margins come in and volume. And so it kind of makes sense. But this could also be a project. Um, I, I really want you to pick one of these from the, so that you have the rest of the semester to work on it in something meaningful. 
So for instance, like I said, if it was, if you want to do like the Atari games, keep in mind, that's going to take a lot of computational power. Um, you don't have to do deep learning of not asking, you know, just a basic reinforcement, uh, basic reinforcement. So there's a difference also. As I've said many times, reinforcement learning has been around for many years before deep learning. It's only that the deep learning algorithms somehow work themselves into this code, okay? So it's like, you know, and I'll probably talk a little bit about that but at some point, but, you know, I don't want to confuse you. So right now, this one does not use deep learning. It only uses reinforcement. Uh, so it's not deep reinforcement learning yet. Anyway, so what I was saying is that the beauty of Jim is that the things that are difficult about reinforcement learning, like figuring out the states, figuring out the features to represent the states, um, the state representation, and the reward functions are already, are already defined for you in the environment. So the reason why we do this line here Jim dot make taxi version three is that by doing that we basically bring in the environment okay we bring the environment we and that includes already reward functions you can see it they're already at version three i'm pretty sure that you know they tweak states they tweaked uh, you know different things all you know reward functions etc of the game um over time right but but they've provided this. So that way, by providing this, we don't have to worry right now about states, about reward functions. We can just worry about the Q learning algorithm. However, as I, as I stated, if you did research on this, like, like the example I gave of, of what we're working on with that uh, flight simulator, then we don't, in that simulator, we are not using Jim. Instead, we kind of looked at Jim and we, we saw how Jim works. And then we created our own environment that interacts via UDP packets with uh, flight sim. Because there's a lot of simulators out there, so we figured that's a nice, and actually that the code was developed by NASA, so it's called X-Plane uh, X, X -Plane Connect, I think, and then they developed it, because I'm sure NASA wanted to, just for demos and things, they wanted to, to do things. And, and X-Plane for a long time, Microsoft was really big, like I remember when I was, you know, in, in college myself, I, I played a lot of flight sim wi in Windows, the, the Microsoft simulator. You know, I liked that game a lot. And this is when we had floppy disk, right? And things like that. So, but then, you know, over the years, x -Plane dominated. And over the last decade, I think, x -Plane 11 has dominated a lot. I think they're uh, more of a European uh, company associated with Airbus, but then, NASA developed code for that. And just recently, I think last year, 2020, uh, Microsoft dropped another um, flight sim, which I have, I, have never, I have not used it yet. And I assume it probably has the UDP capability, so it could probably be used in our work, but obviously you know, we're just gonna stick with what we have. So, so anyway, the point is, the environment is really important, right? The environment is driven by, you know, what simulator you're using or how you're gonna do things. Um, or if you're gonna use, you could also create another environment, another 3D environment. But in our case, um, if we just wanna focus on, on QLearn and not on the, on the reinforcement learning algorithm itself without worrying about the states and without worrying about the reward functions, then Jim is a pretty good thing. I, I have never used the Atari one, but I assume it must be similar. It must also already have the reward functions. It must also already have the states. Okay, so that's really important. Um, so then when we use Jim here, Jim make taxi cab and dot end, we are basically grabbing the entire environment. So think of this as we grab like the simulator or whatever, and we can play in the game now and everything is in it. So, so if I just scroll down, down here, you will see the only way that we need to interact with the game is by this function, environment.step action. Notice that all we do is we give it an action, and once environment takes a step, it returns the new state, right, the new state, and it gives you a reward, and that's it, all right? So that's it. 
Okay, so and so that's I, I I really wanted to emphasize this because I think that sometimes becomes a little unclear for people. Um, you know that they think, oh yeah, it's just like Jim is pretty easy, but yeah, well Jim gives you the reward functions, gives you the state representation, which is you know by the way the hardest part of reinforcement learning. All right, so anyway, so that being said, hopefully that's clear now. You, so you can use uh, Jim for, and there's many games. There's at least Frozen Lake and Taxi Cab, which are usually the ones um, that I do when I when I lecture the courses because they're pretty easy. Uh, taxi cab is considerably more, much more complicated than um, than um, Frozen Lake. Frozen Lake has 16 states. It's a vector of 16. Taxi cab has 500. So it's a, it's a vector of 500. So just by adding a few little complications, it explodes from 16 to 500 states. That's pretty significant. All right, but anyway, uh, all of that is kind of made um, you know, uh, abstracted, if you will, by the environment, by the dream environment. So anyway, uh, let's now get into the code. So I think we're ready to just wrap it up. So we have, we do the gym, uh, we load gym. Here you can see just examples. We render, we reset, we render. Here we can print the action. So this is basically like a list of the actions that are possible for gym, which remember it's like up, down, left, right, pick up, drop off. So I think it's six states. You can print this out. I'm sure it printed when I ran and I just ran really quick. The observation state. So this gives you the idea of like the 500 states. Here there's, there's functions for the encoding and decoding. Like you can provide, you know, what position, what you're doing, picking up, dropping off, et cetera, different parameters. And then it'll convert it into the state representation from one to 500 or so. And then we can print out the state. We can assign the state to the environment like so. And this, you know, that's a way of changing the state uh, when you're doing things. Um, we can render. So we can render the game. And then here, if we wanted to print, um, you know, the position, et cetera, and so on. Okay. So that's just for you. Uh, you know, I, I strongly recommend you play with all of this. Like you, you run, you know, comment out everything else and just run a little bit. All right, now here, this next section, we talked about also on Monday, so I'll just kind of quickly go through it. We have the epics, the penalties, the rewards. Here, this example um, is pretty nice because it's not learning. In, in, this, in this example, the, the agent basically, which is n.step, is just running um, Actually, technically, this would be the agent. This would be the agent because the agent would take a state and, and then based on that state, take an action. But in, in this case, um, it's random. So we're just, you know, notice that it says end action space dot sample. So you're just picking an, a random action. And then given that random action, you plug it in here, you take a step in the game, and then the game returns the current, the new state, the reward, and if you won or lost, if the reward is really low, like minus 10, you actually get a penalty. So you start to increment the number of penalties when you, when you get a bad reward. And you just have, you know, what, what are the rewards? So you'd have to go in and kind of take a look at that. But rewards can be a lot of things. They can be positive, negative, you know, zero, whatever, you know, five, 10. So obviously minus 10 kind of implies it's a really bad mistake, right? And so that's it. If you, if you notice, the game is just really, um, kind of there, just, you know, um, playing, right? That, that's it, that's all it's doing. All, it, all it's doing is, is playing. But what's missing of this is this, you know, we gotta have a smarter way of picking the actions. And then given the, the old state, the new state, the reward, the action, how do we learn? How do we learn so that the next time around we use that information? And so that's kind of missing here in this part of the code. All right, and then finally here, in this uh, array called frames, we are just storing uh, information about the game. So we're basically storing every single frame as it would print out, you know, the, the what it, you know, that, that animation that we saw, right? So 
you take every frame and you're storing it and then you can play a video. So this dictionary, you can see it takes the end render and it just saves it here in frame and then you have state action reward. And then basically you could create a function to run these uh, and print it out later. Here at the end, uh, every time you're running this, you're incrementing the epics, right? And then at the end, you're gonna print out the number of epics that it took you to win the game or get to the end. Because notice here that this loop runs until you win the game. So obviously if you're, if you're doing this randomly, the number of epics is gonna take a long time, right? But if you train and then you run it based on the train data, hopefully it'll take a lot less. And that's the whole point that a train uh, agent should be much faster than a untrained agent, okay? So once you do this, then you can also print out the penalties that kind of correlates with the epics, right? How many, you know, how many penalties did you get? That, you know, implies how many mistakes you made and so on. All right, so, um, so that's just playing it kind of, um, at random. So now obviously, you know, the, the, we, we also want to look at um, the, you know, what if we want to print out the animation. So if you want to print out the animation, you can go through print frames, you can see that frames, uh, you know, this is to view animation, and then uh, you provide the frames, this will enumerate through them, right, clear the OS so that it, it stays put at the top, and then you just print out the frame. So you print out the frame, every frame at the bottom, you can see the, the, app, the, the time step, and then you can see the, the, the state, the action, and the reward information. And that's what we were seeing when this was displaying. And then there's a sleep there, just so, so that it gives us enough time to actually visualize it um, and, and, and kind of, you know, you can slow this down even further if you want to read it more carefully. All right, so that, that kind of illustrates just some of the mechanics. Now we are ready. This is really where we left off last week. Um, or sorry, not last week, on Monday. And it's basically now, how do we train? So if you notice the train part just is this code here until, until this green line. And then after this green line, you assume you've trained. And now instead of training, you're just gonna use the information to play the game to play the game, right? And you can see it in. So it, let's actually start with that part, right? Let's start before we, because this is less complicated. So let's take a look now. So if you remember, first I showed you this one, playing at random. You take a random sample, you input it into the step function. That basically means you played in the game, it gives you a state reward, that's it. And then the game doesn't stop until done is true, right? Done indicates that you, you basically did the task, pick up the person at the pickup location and take them to the drop-off location, all right? So you've completed what you wanted to do. So now let's take a look at um, this other part, not the training yet, but the part where we have actually um, So the part where we have actually trained the model and now we're gonna use the information. So notice here it says, evaluate the agent now that we have learned the Q table. So remember the Q table is uh, where the information is, which is going to be uh, the rows are the states and the columns are the actions, okay? So then we have, so if we have 500 states in this game and we have six actions, it's gonna be 500 by six, okay? So that's an important uh, assumption. So remember, we train for about 100,000 times. And during that 100 times, we updated the Q table every time. Um, and that was really the plan. So here you can see you keep track of total epics, right? You keep track of total penalties. Uh, you also, because you've trained, you assume that you don't need that many episodes. All right, so what you're gonna, an episode just means, it's like in any game, let's say that um, you're playing a game of, um, mm, 
like uh, with a bicycle, right? You need to jump with your bicycle over, you know, a ramp and land on your feet, right? And not, you know, and or land on, on, the, on, the, on the bike, on the wheels of the bike. So, but you've never done it before, but you know how to ride a bike really well. So then, you know, somebody might say to you, okay, I'll give you 10 tries. Do, you know, 10 tries and just one out of 10. Or they might say five tries, you know, one out of five. So that's what this is. So the episodes just basically means, you know, play this a hundred, do a hundred of these moves and you have to win within a hundred moves, right? But that's much, a lot less than a hundred thousand tries before. So that kind of implies that you did learn something. So basically you start the game. So four I in range a hundred, right? And you're going to do this at the end. What you print is the number of episodes that it took you. So why is that relevant? Again, you know, let's say that now there's two of you and there's a price, a new bike. So who wins? Well, it'll be whoever lands on, on the wheels of the bike first. So if, if each of you get five tries and then one person goes and first time they fail, second time, but the third time they get it. Well, the next person does one and they, they succeeded the second time, they win. So that's kind of what this is doing. This is showing, okay, after, you know, you run this multiple times, right? And so whichever agent does it in fewer episodes is the best one. These other things like average time steps per episode, that's total epics divided by episodes. You can see here, uh, there's, there's actually two for loops in this, right? And so you, you're basically given five games and within each game, you have a number of steps to take, okay? So this assumes, of course, that it's more, much more comp. So that assumes in, in the analogy of the bike, it's like, well, you need to do the jump, that's the whole game, but then you need to pedal and then kind of align the bike and then, you know, swerve and then get on the ramp, you know, do a twist or whatever in the air. So that that's, you know, it involves steps, right? So that, that's the idea. So this is just a way of saying, well, you know, how many, what is the average time steps per episode? Also the same equivalent total penalties per episode. So these are just indicators of <laughs> who's best, right? So you, if you run this game, so if you did a project like this, <coughs> you would report, you would use these as measures of, you know, let's say that Josh and then uh, Jacob and, and Ryan, you know, you, all three of you were competing against each other. So then, okay, you know, who won? Well, the one that has fewer episodes, the one that has better average time steps per episode, the one that has lowest average penalties per episode, right? So those are the parameters. So now let's get into the game itself, right? So we're going to play basically a hundred games. So if we, if we think of another analogy that's a little bit more intuitive, chess, right? So we have chess and it's gonna, you're gonna play five chess games against the computer. And out of those five chess games, you will have a number of, of moves, right? That you can make until um, you win, right? And so in this case, you can see here, we said basically that we have, you know, episodes 100 so you're going to play it 100 times but then if you look at this while loop here it simply says while not done so basically you're going to play you're going to have enough steps until you win the game this game is simple enough that eventually you you should win it right it's not like one of those games where you could just continue forever um so that's basically what it is so then you start the first game, right? The first, uh, in this case, taxi cab, right? In, in the taxi cab then, um, what do you do? So you reset the game. So, because you're starting a new game. So end reset just means reset the game and you randomly start somewhere in the game. So then it gives you that state where you are, you know, what position you have, you know, where is the, the, the customer? Where are you taking them, et cetera. You initialize the rewards, the penalties, and the epics, the all zeros, and the game is at false, which basically means that, um, you know, uh, you haven't won, 
So now you get into this part, right? And if you notice, every time also, before we get into the while, every time you play an episode of the game, one game, you're keeping a tally of the total penalties. So you see that total, pen uh, total penalties, right? You're keeping a tally of that. And you're also keeping a score of the total epics that it's taking. Okay, so that, you know, that's also important here. Um, you're keeping track of that information, the number of epics that it took. So the epics are part of this while loop, as you can see. So now we can focus on the main part. So you're in the first game or the second game, whatever. You're in a state. You haven't won yet. So what do you do now? Notice that here we have action again. Before I said that we would take the action randomly, right? So I'm gonna go left, right, uh, up, down, pick up, drop off, whatever, by ra at random. But obviously that's not the way that we wanna do it. We wanna, we wanna know if we're far from our destination, we wanna drive, if we're close, to, if we're right there where we pick up our passenger, we pick them up and so on. So then here, that's all represented in the state. And so now this time around, notice that we take an action based on something. So we do Q table. Q table is basically the, the, the table that we have uh, built, okay? It's the, it's the information that we have. So in this case, we just pick a row, okay? So if you think about it, so notice there it says Q table state, right? So it says Q table state. So let's go to the, the, the um, this thing here. All right, and if we look at Q table state, oops. All right, so if we look at Q table, State, right? We have that there. So now um, this is a Q table like this, right? So it's got from one to all the way to, I think it's like 500 states. The states are the rows and then the columns are the actions. So it's up, down, left, right, pick up and drop off. So this is Drop off, this is down. All right, and so if you notice in, in the code, it says Q table state. So what that means is, let's say that the state is 32 because these are the states 32. So we pick that one. You see that? We just grab that row with all, all its six columns. So now Q table state you know, has that row with the six values, so this might be 0.5. Remember that we've already trained 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.1, so four, and so on, dot, dot, dot. Of these four, which one do we pick? We wanna pick the one with the highest value, so that would be an action of up. Does that part make sense, guys? Yeah. All right, so then, if we go back to the code, what does that mean? We grab that row in here, right? And then what do we use? We use, we've used this already, right? We use this function in the naive base, right? So what does np.argmax do? npargmax takes, returns the index of the highest value. So in this case, if we go back to the board, it would return the index of this one. So the indices would be zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So it's gonna return zero, there's your action, right? It corresponds because of the way we've encoded, encoded it, it corresponds to up. And so that's all we have to do. So we pick, just by doing an NPR max of that row, we have our action now up. So basically given that's, that's and that's it, that, you know, that's literally, the magic of this, okay? You know, the simplest, uh, the algorithm we're learning, Q learning, it's as simple as that. Now we haven't trained it, mind you, and that's the other additional component, but as far as using it, 
take the row, take the argmax of it, we have the action. Now we plug the action in the, in the step function. So that means we play that action. We were, we were there in the board and we're going up. So the game then, you know, it runs, it runs this inside and it gives you a new state. That means that you move now the taxi cab to another position. It's gonna tell you based on the reward function if that was a good move or not. Hopefully because you've learned already, it is a good move. And then it tells you if you've won or lost. So probably it's the beginning of the game. So you haven't won yet. Then all it does is it, if it, you, can, you can do this, I mean, this can or cannot be necessary. It just depends. Uh, but it's a way of telling if you get a lot of these minus tens, the negative rewards, then basically it's a lot of penalties. Okay. So you, you know, this again, if, like I said, if you were comparing each of you were running the game, I would use this to say who, who's the best, right, at the game. So then you get the penalties, you increase the epics. There's nothing else. That's it. You see how simple it is? Yeah. No, no quite. It, I mean, stop me if you have any questions or what I mean. So, but in my opinion, it's, it's really that simple. Okay. So now all that's left then is, okay. All right. So you said you use the Q table. So I said, right, that we use the K, Q table. Remember though, that initially, so that's the last problem for us to address. Initially, the Q table didn't have these nice values like these, right? So it didn't have um, all of those. Instead, the Q table is really, um, if you look at it, you know, states and actions, right? It might be zero or it might, it, it is zero actually the way that I, um, cause I, you'll see, uh, I'm just using a uh, NumPy zeros matrix initially. So it's a lot of zeros, but as we train, we're gonna train a hundred thousand iterations and our goal, our goal will be that the Q table, remember this is the Q table, it's going to remain, you know, it's going to have its states and actions, but it's going to be optimally filled, right? So it's now 0 0.5, 0 0.01, dot, 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 and so on. So all the values will be there. And this is done during the training. So now the last piece of the puzzle is how do we train, right? So how do we train? And so now let's go back to the code. Again, I've been showing all the contrasts. So you've seen here. The contrast between now just playing the game. So we're going to use code very similar to this, but now we need to have the element of training. So now we go to this part of the code you see here, and you can see it's not that much bigger, right? It's not really that much longer. So <laughs> again, now, at, you know, this is the training phase, so training. <coughs> happens here, right? And so what do you do? So if you, if you think about it, again, you know, obviously NumPy, uh, here we create the Q table. So what I just said initially, we create a NumPy array of zeros, okay? The dimensions are gonna be n observation space, those are the states, so this is 500, right? Or so, whatever the, it is. Uh, and then this one, the columns, is the action space, right? So let's say six actions, up, down, left, right, pick up, drop off, right? So, so you we create basically the matrix of 500 by six that I kind of just showed in the notes or in the, in the whiteboard. So that's the thing that we have to train so that we can later use it like this, okay? All right, so now how do we train it? So the trick is then, um, so you can, uh, you can see now I've added these parameters, alpha, gamma, and epsilon. So the, and they have values. There's going to be, so as you might imagine to train, there's going to be an equation. Okay. There's an equation that we're going to use. It was created by a person called, uh, last name Bellman, and therefore it's called the Bellman equation. Okay. And so we use the Bellman equation which is a very effective function for calculating uh, the values, 
in the queue table. All right, so I just want, before I get into like the specifics of the, of the Bauman equation, I really just want to kind of show you in the code, right? What's different and what isn't. So notice I added these three values. They're literally just for the Bellman equation. They're basically parameters that allow you to say how important certain things are. So think of them as, as weights, right? So, you know, if I look at information in the present versus the future, which one's more important? Well, I can control it by multiplying by, by this, right? So if I multiply something by 0 0.001, Basically, it becomes that term becomes zero, so it's less important versus multiplying something times 0.5 or one itself, right? That term becomes really important. All right, so anyway, these that's basically what you can think of those that way. Then here you have again arrays of all the epochs and all the penalties, and you're going to keep track of this again just to see how you're doing. Then here you do for i in range 100,000, so notice we're going to train for 100,000 times. So this is equivalent to saying, we're gonna play the game 100,000 times, okay? Because notice the while loop is here, right? The same while loop, but this time, and this is the while loop that goes until you win. While not done, remember that done means you won the game. So when, when, when you run step, right? Done is true only once when you win the game. Otherwise, it's always false. So basically, you're going to play the game 100,000 times. You reset the game. So end reset, that means because you're starting a new game, it's going to assign a random state, right? A, a random state is assigned there. Again, you initialize the epics, the penalties, and the rewards because you want to keep track of this. Uh, again, so that you can compare later on. You initialize done to false because nobody has won yet. You're just starting a game. And then here is the while, while loop, right? So this is where all the magic will happen for each game, right? So we'll come back to that. And then here we can just see in every game, once you have, um, once you have uh, done something, you know, <coughs> you, you do modulus of 100, right? So that you don't have to print every iteration. I, you only print every 100 iterations by doing this. And then you clear the screen, right? OS system CLC, it just clears the screen. And then you print out some information, all right? So you print out basically the I, just to kind of keep track of where you are in the game. You also here, notice that this is not really printing the game as it's training, but you could, okay? This is not really uh, printing the game as it's training. Um, that's only really done in, you know, in, the, in that first example that I gave you. But you could use this function, print frames, you know, in, during training and during testing, it's just that, you know, 100,000 iterations would be a lot. So anyway, this just prints basically the, the current episode, you know, the, that you are on. And then, tr you know, this just prints training is finished. Uh, and then this is just after training, after training, this is kind of a check that, you know, because the game is pretty, well, it's almost pretty deterministic in a sense that you kind of know how it's going to learn. So basically what this says is this is a check to say, well, if after a hundred thousand iterations, it learned really well, <clears throat> then we know for sure that every time that you're in state 328, you know, that, that encoding represents where the cab is, where the passenger is and everything. So it's always pretty consistent. So if you're in state 328, the action uh, should be north. Okay, so, so if you, this will give you the, the vector of the six actions and you'll be able to see that north will have the highest value. Okay, so that's basically what that does. So now all that remains of everything that we've looked at is this piece of code, okay? That's really... Okay, so that's basically all it is. Um, all right, so that, that's really all that is left. 
Okay, so now we can focus on this. And if you think about it, this part is similar to this part, right? So it's going to have the same, uh, same elements, but it needs to have the new element of training. All right, so now let's kind of focus on this part. And we can see, for instance, that the first part is quite interesting. So I'm highlighting just this, right? So this, this if statement here, if, you know, random else, is the same thing as this line here. It, it revolves around getting the action. In when you train, you basically can rely 100% on the Q table because the Q table is trained. However, when you're learning, when you're learning, you can't really depend on the Q table in the beginning. So the first, you know, 10,000 iterations, it's all random. It's, it's, it's all serials, right? So you really don't know what's going on there. So what, you, what this implies is that you're going to kind of randomly, and there are other ways of doing this. There are, there are other ways. There are some ways that actually keep track of how many iterations you've done. So the, the closer you get to 100,000, the less it should rely on randomness. But in this case, if you notice, this is just a random function. So you take a random, you know, from a, from a distribution that is a random uniform distribution between zero and one, you're just going to pick a value, any value. And then you control by this epsilon, which is only 0 0.1, when you take a random action. So, you know, let's say, for instance, 10% of the time, the value will be between 0 and, point and, and, zero and point 0.1. Therefore, 10% of the time, it'll take a random action. The rest of the time, the value, it's going to be 0.2, which is less than 0.1. Therefore, it will not take a random action. So this is just, in the beginning, you want just to take random actions because that allows you to explore, right? So that allows you, you don't want to always, you know, once you start to learn a pattern in the Q table, you don't want to always follow that pattern you know, as if it's set in stone. Instead, what you want to do is, you know, I'm following the pattern, but every now and then I'm going to take an unexpected turn. And that just allow that is called exploring. It allows you to try other things because when you try that state, you're going to get a reward and then the Q table will get adjusted yet again. Okay. But if you don't take the random action, then you rely on the Q table. So, so here you select an optimal action on the table. So this is something that if you're tackling a new problem, you have to play with this. Here for a taxi cab, it's easy enough that this just works. We, we just know it works. So either the action is taken from the Q table itself, but just keep in mind, it's not always taken from it. Sometimes you take a random action, whatever it is, you know, just like we did in the beginning, this just takes a random action because we want to explore and not get, um, you know, it's similar to what, you know, when you guys, I'm sure when you were, um, let's say you were, um, you know, what's an example? You know, th this idea, what if I try this? I'm going to try this and see, you know, see what happens. You're kind of, you know, kind of exploring, you know, and whatever, whatever task that you're, you're, you know, you're playing, maybe learning how to play the piano and you've learned a little bit already and then you start and you say okay you know i'm going to try this note and i'm going to switch to a c you know uh, on this on this further to the right further to the left you know and, and on the piano and, and see what happens to my my tune or something like that right so that's that's the randomness part of it so anyway if you notice that's all this is all right so it's not more complicated than that the result of that is that you pick the action and then, just like you did before, you play the game with the action. Notice the game gives you the next state, right, where you're going to end up after taking the action, plus you have the original state. So you have the current state and the new, you know, you have, let's say, the old state, where you were, and now where you are after taking the action. You also have the reward that it gave you, and it tells you if you won or lose. Now, uh, Jim gives you this idea of info. It gives you just more information. This is something we don't use, okay? So now, now that you've done that, 
all that is left is this part here. All right, this part here. Uh, we're going to leave that for last just so I can talk about these two other parts here. So this one is just similar to the other ones. If a reward was negative, you increment the penalty to keep track of things. Obviously, when you do the next iteration of your game, you need to make what is the new state, the old state, right? So now, because in the next, the next uh, iteration of the game, you are now in the new state. So that, so next state, uh, sorry, next state here should become just regular state. So that in, when you play again, you have um, state, regular state, and then you, that gives you an action and action gives you next state. So there's always like a, a old state and a new state, right? And so that, that this is pretty standard in programming. When you do iterations, you kind of replace the old variable with the new value and so on. And then this just increments the epic. Okay, so really then, now notice that all we have left in this entire algorithm is these four lines of code. Okay, and these four lines of code are called the Bellman equation, right? They're basically what you use for the Bellman equation. Now, the Bellman equation is right here. It's this line here. If you notice, the Bellman equation takes some parameters and it calculates a new value. That new value is here, and notice what that new value does is it updates the Q table. Given the state, not the new state, but the old state, right, and the action that you took. So it's basically saying, if you took, if you were in this state and you took this action, right, you were in, you know, state here, this state, you took this action, and now you receive this reward that made you end up in this next state. That reward is very important because if you notice, it is right here in the equation. So the Bellman equation will use that value reward to calculate a number. So it might be that it's a good reward, it's a bad reward, whatever it is, that value gets uh, transformed based on these parameters in this line to give you this new value and then that new value is assigned in the Q table to the, not the new state, but the, the, the state where you were, that where you took an action and you ended up in another state that gave you a reward. So that is how you make the update to the Q table based on the Bellman equation. So if you understand this line, then now we only have three lines of code left. And these three lines of code just help you to uh, figure out the Bellman equation itself. So if you think about it here, what you do is, now, now we can focus just on these three. So let me just do like this so I can, or actually maybe I can do this, right? So it's a little bit clearer. We already hopefully understand how to, that we update the Q table. Now this is the Bellman equation. So I can just write, Bellman, thinking JavaScript. All right, so Bellman um, equation, right? That's the Bellman equation that gives you a value that allows you to do an update. So now we can think about the parameters that go in here, right? So if we think it takes a value alpha 0 0.1, that's this one. So it's one minus 0 0.1 multiplied times the old value. So that's the first component of it. Usually when you have things like one minus a 0 0.1, they're just weights, okay? So just think of it as how much importance do I give to the value, old value? Do I want it to be really important? Do I want it to be not very important, right? So if I had made alpha equal 0 0.9, then it's one minus 0 0.9 basically that's 0 0.1, that means old value has very little importance. But here we're saying one minus 0 0.1, that's 0 0.9, basically we're saying old value should have a lot of importance. So we have to think, what is this old value? Okay, old value is right here, it's this one, right? What is old value? Old value is you go into the Q table, 
Because remember, the Q table at some point will have good values already, so you want to use them, right? And so what you do is you take, before you update state and action, notice that you update state and action here, right? You, up, you update the current state that, that led you to take this action that resulted in a new reward in a new state. Okay, that Q table, that value is the one that you replace. But before you replace it, you actually copy it here, right? So you take Q table state action and you call it old value instead of new value kind of makes sense, right? So you keep the old value. And then that just plugs in. So basically you take the old, the old states value from the Q table, you multiply it times that epsilon, or sorry, that alpha, just to kind of say how important it is. It is important. And then you add to this the next component, which is this one, okay? Now this component, if you notice, also has a weight, alpha right? And alpha is the same alpha. So it's, it, this is kind of a little game that is saying, um, for instance, if I make alpha equal 0 0.9, then 1 minus 0 0.9 is 0 0.1. That means that old value is not very important. But on the other side, alpha is 0 0.9. So I'm making this other term really important. Here, we do vice versa. Alpha is 0 0.1. So 1 minus 0 0.1 is 0 0.9 this term here is really important. This one is only 0 0.1. So this one is a little less important, okay? But you know, that's how you control that. If you made alpha 0 0.5, they're both equally important, okay? So that's all that's happening here. So after that then, that just leaves this. That's all we have left, right, uh, to understand. We already know what old value is. And we also have this next max, okay? So we have to figure out what that next max, but that next max is actually one of the three parameters here. So reward, we know we got that from the reward function, right? Reward just says, uh, this is your reward. So you're, you're either, you either did good or, or not. So that, that, you know, that's what that encodes. So then we have, what about this gamma times next max? If you notice, yet again, we're adding reward plus something else. What is gamma? Gamma is 0 0.6. Guess what, guess what gamma is? It's another weight to indicate the importance of next max. So for instance, if I said gamma is 0 0.001, so you take that multiplied times next max, what is that equal to basically? Zero point zero 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 one times next max. It's almost zero, right? It's almost zero. So, so that's really what it and you know it would basically render this unimportant. However, gamma has a value of 0 0.6, so we are implying that it is in fact important. Okay, and so we want to consider it. So these are parameters that you can play with. But um, so that tells you, okay, we're going to add to reward another value, and that value is uh, important. So what is next max? Well, that just leaves the last line of code left, right, which is this one. So in this case, what do we do? We look at the Q table again, but, and we grab a row of a state, but notice that this time around, we don't grab like we did before. So here we were grabbing the Q table state, right? Where, where you were. In this case, we grab Q table next state. You see that? Next state, what is next state? Next state is what you get after taking the action. So next state. So it's almost like you were here, you took an action that resulted in a reward and it put you somewhere else on the board. And now that's also what you're going to consider. You're going to go into the Q table for that next state. You grab that row. And this time around, we don't need the action, right? We don't want, so we don't use argmax like we do, you know, like we do over here. This returns the index of the highest value. So what do you think NPmax does? 
what would it return if not the index? The actual value. The actual value, perfect. Because that's what we need, right? Because we're dealing with, you know, so if you, if you look the reward, the old value, the next max, they're just values in the Q table that we are grabbing. And so in this case, we grab the value given that vector for next state, we just grab the highest one. It doesn't matter which action it is. You know, we just grab um, the one that's the most important there, which would correspond to the highest action for that one. And then that next max gets plugged in there, right? It's done, and that's it. That's the Bellman equation, right? All of that is explained in the chapter, but I think hopefully this was clear enough. And that's it, guys. That's literally it. This is how you learn in reinforcement learning. You know, straight, you know, plain vanilla, straight, uh, you know, uh, Q learning. You just do this with the Bellman equation, done. Not very complicated. Notice that you don't have to worry about if I'm in this state and I'm going to win the game 10 states in the future, do I need to include all 10 states? No. It's simply look at the current state and look at the next state that you get, and that apparently is good enough. <laughs> so, so that's actually pretty, pretty, pretty impressive, I would say. And that's it. So that's, you know, that's the entire code. If you look, we've gone through the code line by line, and hopefully if you understood this lecture, you now understand how uh, reinforcement learning works, the Bellman equation, all of it. Keep in mind, the environment, Jim, does abstract the part about the states and the rewards. That's actually already done. And usually when you're taking a new problem, like let's say flying that plane or you know, teaching Spot, the robot from Boston Dynamics to do some task, you know, obviously, you would have to create those reward functions and the state mechanism and that, but that's, you know, that's, you do, you do that, you know, you'll probably create your own company, right? So you'll be the next Elon Musk. All right. So, you know, those, those are the great things about, about that. All right. So anyway, um, that's, that's it. All right. That's the algorithm. Um, we've covered it. This is already on GitHub, so you can play with it. We'll talk about homework related to this, um, an, an easy one, just running all of this. Um, after spring break, I don't really wanna uh, get into this right now. Um, and then I'll just do this again, kind of for completion, uh, to run the game again. You can see, usually I, I like to run the code after. So you can see there it is. Everything I've explained now is stored there. Are there any questions about reinforcement learning? None for me. No. All right. So uh, I'm going to then uh, stop this game first because I don't want this. All right. So that's stopped. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. And at this point, uh, we are done with uh, reinforcement learning, you know, with Q learning, certainly we're done. What I want to do in the time that we have left is just uh, focus on your homework assignment. So I know there's a WECA homework due tonight, and there's also the recommender system homework. So let's just talk a little bit about that. I'm going to stop the video now.